I'm going to read to you here and talk about the Emerald Seal of Thoth. He gave this to me, and I put it his his transmission on it in Temple Doors, issue 3 4, 1993. Now, there's no real way to actually artistically create the seal. Verbatim. That is, as this is the seal, this is what it looks like, because it doesn't look like anything. Specifically, it looks like a lot of things. What really I should say it looks like it can be presented in many different artistic forms, but there's not one form that says this is it. So what you're seeing on the screen is the Emerald Seal of Thoth as he gave it to me more recently. But qualifying that this is an interpretation, this is an aspect, it's still very radiant and powerful in representing the Emerald Seal, but it is an interpretation because there's no actual visual of that. The other image I'm going to be showing you is the pentagram of Thoth, which was given also rather recently to me, and that represents an aspect within the Emerald Seal. The pentagram has its kind of own focus. We'll get to that in a minute, but it is still part of the whole picture. So that said, I'm going to read to you what I received from Thoth on the Emerald Seal. The Emerald Seal is a cast of the authority of the office of Thoth, which is my designate in the archetypal manifest given forth from the hierarchy of the divine Christ. The Emerald Ray is the radiant mergence of the golden ray of Michael as it strikes the pure life force within the race house of Solaria which radiant rays are gold, blue, and violet. The synergized quality of this interpolation is the emerald ray, which is a crystallized higher form of the green ray. The position of my office in the stations of hierarchical government is within the eighth sphere or circumvention of the sacred harmonies. Herein rests the full cycle, the beginning of the opposite house. As the last house is dissension, I, I'm going to read this as de-ascension. It's really spelled wrong here, I believe. So I'm going to call it de-ascension, which isn't a real word, of course, but this is what Thoth is giving. Or the opposite is ascension. So we have, I have it written as like a dissent, you know, like a, I don't agree, dissension. And ascension is something to to agree with. And I believe in one aspect he re he meant this, but in another aspect I believe he meant the ascension, moving back down the spiral, or ascension moving up the spiral. So we're going to look at it in both ways here. <laughs> Understand that within the records of Thoth, as I was in the age of Egypt, I, get, I give the eighth sphere as to that which the soul ascends. You see, here he's talking about ascension as A-S-C-E-N-T-I-O-N. Indeed, from the perspective of resurrection, so it is in the ascension, for the eighth sphere is the capstone of the ether pyramid, from which both, now he spells it, I say he, he gave it to me to spell, A-S-S-E-N-T-I-O-N, and D-E-S-S-E-N-T-I-O-N is active. So he's really bringing the two together. The idea of ascension is being, uh, you are, you're, you're giving ascent to the full light, to moving upward with de-ascension, moving down, you're, you're working in the field of, of descent of chaos. I know it's a little confusing, but I'm doing the best I can with it here. The eighth sphere is neither that which was nor that which is becoming. It is the pause in between, the essential eighth chord of rest. The three circles, golden, blue, and violet, represent the passage or orbit of the three 
race rays of my lineage. Through the activity of my race rays and through the generative forces is the completion of the sacred harmonies made manifest. Outside the spheres is the golden circle representing the ray of the race source which descends through the eighth spheres to become generative in the radiance of the blue ray. So, when it is descending, it is descending into chaos. But we think of chaos as something really awful. You know, like, oh my gosh, it's so chaotic, I can't take it. You know, that kind of thing. But chaos, he's told me before, is an, an aspect of creation. It's a creational force. Out of chaos comes stability. You have to sometimes have chaos first. So all of these things need to be taken into consideration. Because from the Thothic perspective, things are not good and bad. They are in a state of, of entropy, or they are in a state of centropy. And of course, entropy is not where you want to dwell. But entropy is a process that leads to centropy. So... It's a matter of how long are you dwelling in entropy to get this entropy? <laughs> you know, that's where the problem is created. Within the sphere circle moves the violet ray, that of the habitation or physical active association with earth. The center of the seal reveals the Solomonic temple identifying with the central sun and being raised upward on pillars of telluric force through the elemental matrix, ultimately to be wed with the pillars of force through the elemental... I, I think I read that twice. Oh, let me see. This I'm having to uh, read this off of the screen because this comes from a Temple Doors issue that... Um, I, I it's been scanned. I've lost the original. I'm, I'm thinking I, I now may have it in a box somewhere, but right now I don't. So I'm trying to read it off the screen with my um, cataract eyes. <laughs> so I'll try this again. The center of the seal reveals the Solomonic temple identifying with the central sun and being raised upward on pillars of telluric force through the elemental matrix ultimately to be wed with the pillars of force through the through the ultimately to be wed with the pillars of force through the elemental matrix uh, no through the Oh, I'm sorry. I just can't read this. Let me try it again. The center of the seal reveals the Solomonic temple, identifying with the central sun and being raised upward on pillars of telluric force through the elemental matrix, ultimately to be wed with the pillars of force through the ultimately to be wed with the pillars of light from the radiation neutrons of the cosmic sun. It seems that I've made a, uh, a typographical error where I repeated the line twice, and that confused me even more. So, we're going to look at this again. The center of the seal reveals the Solomonic temple, identifying with the central sun and being raised upward on pillars of telluric force through the elemental matrix ultimately to be wed with the pillars of light from the radiation neutrons of the cosmic sun. Yes, that's the way it should be read. And my confusion was this I had uh, duplicated a sentence in there. The geometric vectors of the Solomonic Temple bind the form of the seal so that it radiates a set vibration which is attuned to the pristine fluid of the primal matter. This original fluid unbinding and matter binding is the embodied externalization of creation. Through the exchange between the fluid and matter, the continuity of source structure of archetypal infinity is assured. 
I think this is really powerful stuff. That's why I'm squinting at the st- screen <laughs> and trying to read it to you all. I know it's deep, but you know, it's at the very heart of creation. Light is the third element of the sacred three. It strikes the resonant atoms of fluid and matter and activates the exchange process. This process is the inertia, the selective dividing and multiplying of internal patterns, both genetic and kinetic, which maintains the survival of the first principle from which all is born and reborn. The four pyramids within the spheres are the Telluric generation of the Templaric manifest. Two are are undivided in ray power, and two contain both positive and negative poles. The whole interacts with the divided and current. The whole interacts with the divided, and the current is exchanged. The whole is the fluid unbinding symbol. The divided binding is the matter. The eighth inverted pyramids outside the spheres are the descending radiation from the cosmic sun. Each inverted pyramid contains a sacred alchemical symbol of its generative power. About the seal is the symbol, symbolic white feathered serpent, which is the telluric force in cosmic union, or freed, thus in flight. It breathes life into its own force, making it generative into itself, needing no other condition for survival. This Thus, the emerald seal, which has been given to you to produce, is in its symbolic form. Now, I'm realizing as I read this that I hand drew another version of the emerald seal. And as he's saying, it's it's not the ultimate. And this has the feathered serpent wrapping around it. I actually hand drew this. And I thought, I know I have it scanned somewhere. But right now, I don't know where that is. So we're going to continue here. In actual radiance, it would resemble the symbolic, yet it would be, it would be of a freer form, more like the crystal pattern of an iton, which is the purest of atomic particles within the third universe, that which is known to you. The seal has been given to, well, I'm not going to read that part, um, because it goes into, Stuff that I was doing back then with my temple and everything. Um, so now, Thoth now, Thoth informs me that the Emerald Seal of Thoth is an alchemical mandala contained within the Book of Thoth, a lost work, which, a lost work. And, um, if we look into the Secret Teachings of Ages by Manly P. Hall, now I'm quoting from Manly P. Hall here. While Hermes still walked the earth with men, he entrusted to his chosen successors the secret book of Thoth. The work contained the secret processes by which the regeneration of humanity was to be accomplished and also served as the key to his other other writings. Nothing definite is known concerning the contents of the book of Thoth other than its pages were covered with strange hieroglyphic figures and symbols which gave to those acquainted with their acquainted with their use, unlimited power over the spirits of the air and the subterranean divinities. When certain areas of the brain are stimulated by the secret processes of the mysteries, the consciousness of man is extended and he is permitted to behold the immortals and enter into the presence of the superior gods. The Book of Thoth described the method whereby this stimulation was accomplished in truth Therefore, it was the key to immortality. Before I continue with Manly here, you know, Thos tells me he never physically wrote any of these books. I mean, maybe he made a laundry list here and there, but he never physically wrote these books. He he literally imbur- um, imbued them into the Akashic Record through a, a lightning force experience in his body. It was... he. Gave me the information in, in the, the Blue Star, Stone Manual, which I want to re, um, present in a form soon. But anyway, uh, this is how he cr- created these books. They're in the Akasha. And then his scribes in different periods of time, maybe one of those scribes, um, have translated them. 
or translated out of them. Okay, to continue with Manly. According to legend, the Book of Thoth was kept in a golden box in the inner sanctuary of the temple. There was but one key, and this was the, in the possession of the Master of Mysteries, the highest initiate of Hermetic Arcanum. He also knew what was written in the secret book. The Book of Thoth was lost to the ancient world with the decay of mysteries, but its faithful initiates carried it, it sealed, it sealed in, in the sacred cask, casket, I'm sorry, into another land. The book is still in existence and continues to lead the disciples of this age into the presence of immortals. No other information can be given to the world concerning it now but the apostolic, apostolic succession from the first hierophant initiated by Hermes himself remains unbroken to this day, and those who are pr particularly fitted to serve the immortals but may discover the priceless document if they will search sincerely and tirelessly for it. It has been asserted that the Book of Thoth is, in reality, the mysterious Tarot of the Bohemians, a strange emblematic book of 78 leaves, which has been in the possession of the gypsies since the time when they were driven from the ancient temple, the Serapium. According to the secret histories, the gypsies were originally Egyptian priests. There are now in the world several secret schools privileged to initiate candidates in the mysteries, but in nearly every instance they lighted their altar fires from the flame torch of Herm. Hermes, in his Book of Thoth, revealed to all mankind the one way, and for ages the wise of every nation and every faith had reached immortality by the way established by Hermes in the midst of the darkness for the redemption of humanity. Now that's the end of what Manly P. Hall is saying there. Now according to Thoth, this book has been revealed to many, not many, but more than just a few, through several ages of time in various forms. And that includes the work that I do, you know, with all the work that I've done these over 50 years. Certainly it's not the only source, but it is one of them. So, um, let me see where I want to continue from here. So now I'm going to continue in that same issue of Temple Doors and write what Thoth says about the Farana, P-H-A-R-A-N-A, -A, the Farana Rising. The Farana is the oblisk cylinder containing the staff or rod of Moses. This is situated in the year 6068 AD on the holy isle of Mana in the Emerald Sea. In your time experience, this is the region of the Dead Sea. Now I have to stop here uh, for a moment because I was not at that time in 1993, understanding, truly, even though I knew about the New Earth Star, he was calling it, I don't know, something else at the time. He really hadn't gotten in to really talking to me about the New Earth Star. Also, I didn't understand a lot about the various dimensional phasings that are going on here. So when he's saying this to me, I'm not really getting it when I wrote it down here. So I don't offer an explanation. But when he's talking about the year 60, 60068, so what is that? 6068, I guess, AD. That may is probably not the same as our linear time that we're on right now, getting us to a 6068 AD, if we even make it that far before the whole ascension thing happens. So I don't know what time he's using is this, but he does say A.D. So, you know, it's it's a little iffy here. It's possible that there's a corollary between our 6068 A.D. energetically with what is going on on the Isle of Man Mana. That's what I, as I'm saying that, I'm getting a Thoth feed that's telling me. So if we looked at our 6068 A.D. now, if presuming we can get there, 
on our linear time in the reality zone magneto field that we're in. It would correlate with what is going on on the Holy Isle of Mon in the Emerald Sea in the New Earth Star lip of time that uh, is related to this concept because the the Isle of Mana, the Emerald Sea, um, the uh, all of this that he's relating to me again and again in this period of time is I do not believe in this time reality zone. It's it's removed from that. That's what I'm trying to get to. <laughs> so going back to what he's saying here. The Farana is the oblisk cylinder containing the staff or rod of Moses. This is situated in the year 6068 AD on the Isle, Holy Isle of Mana in the Emerald Sea. In your time experience, this is the region of the Dead Sea. We say that the Farana does contain the rod of Moses, but from your time orientation, this does not yet exist. However, Ah, uh, just a moment. Uh, through the combined focus of the Isis Templars, now that was my group at the time that I had thought that had me bring together, are to place the staff within the Farana. So we were working doing a, you know, a synergic uh, visualization work, energy work. And this is what he's speaking about. It has been entrusted for this purpose through... Um, Templar, our Templars at the time, Kathleen of the Three Rivers, given from the one Akbar, whose totem form is the Black Wolf. Uh, this goes on and on and stuff we don't really need to hear, so I'm just going to skip that. Okay, the Holy Staff, the Rod of Moses, was crafted through the high Enochian magic by 72 magicians, both male and female, under the guidance of the Enochian archmage Menon who was the benefactor of both Akhenaten and Akhenaten's son, Mosai, or Moses. The, the rod of Moses was created to be attached to the Ark of Grace, descended from the blue star Rigel in Orion to Earth through the Tibetan temple of A-U-R-I-A-I-S. Now, what he's talking about here is what, you know, the sacred awe that he is at this time energetically positioned inside the... Uh, mountain that both calls the um, the crest in the stone which is actually Mount Challenges right out my window here ah, so back to this um, so he's saying that you know, talking about the Ark of Grace descended from the Blue Star Rising of Orion to Earth through the Tibetan Temple of Arias from there, it was brought into Egypt by Thoth of Rasmus. Upon the journey at the banks of the Kuthi River in Tibet, Thoth of P-Y-R-E-N-T-H-U-S declared that the Ark of Arias not be taken further. Now, this Thoth of Perinthius, calling himself Babet and all of that, this is in the book I wrote or started to write on Thoth. It was a false Thoth. Okay, Thoth is a title. Okay, and this Thoth fellow was saying, well, you're not the Thoth, Thoth Rasmus, I'm the Thoth. And this is where all this began, and he refused to let Thoth Rasmus take it past him on the banks of the Kuthi River. So this Thoth, this false Thoth, declared that the oak, the oak, the Ark of Arius not be taken further. There was a Tathathali created, which is a magic square with a pentagram inside it employed as a field for combatant energy. These two Thoths were in effect involved in a wrestling match of magic. This false Thoth was forced to withdraw and the Ark passed. The intent of Thoth of Rasmus in removing the Ark from Arias and taking it into Egypt was to restore the time continuum of the shepherds through a path that allowed the redemption of Lucifer that allow the redemption of Lucifer. Now that's really interesting. I've forgotten that. That is a powerful sentence there. Let me read it again. Uh, the intent of Thoth Rasmus in removing the Ark from Arius in Tibet and taking it into Egypt was to restore the time continuum of the shepherds through a path that allowed the redemption of Lucifer. 
The false thief in his hood sought to cut off the hand of a fence and to create a separate continuum. Within the Ark, the Sacred On, I'm going to call it the Sacred On here because we're getting so many different names, it's really confusing. Within the Sacred On, which we will now refer to as the Ark of Grace, yes, came to Mount Sinai through the guardianship of Moses and Aaron, both high priests of Enoch. Moses was told by the Lord of Light to attach the staff to the Ark. He obeyed the mountain and land surrounding it was transformed. It was no longer a barren place. It had to become a mount of sapphire. Above two moons burned in an indigo sky. Only Moses and Aaron beheld this transformation. To the others, the heavens brought upon them a great wind and hail plummeted their bodies. Fire consumed them within. They could not withstand the transference. Thus Moses designated, disengaged the staff from the sacred, from the ark of grace, but only after he had ascended the crystal mountain and returned with the sapphire talus, the tablets, which had been entrusted to him by the Lord of light to be placed within the ark of grace. Thereafter, Mo Moses ascended the Mount of Sinai once again. This time he climbed the back of a stark and jagged giant, and there he beheld the burning bush of Yahweh, the Lord of the lesser world. Holy was he, yet he guardianed the path of ignorance. From this experience, Moses brought forth the simple clay commandments and instructions to build the Ark of Karma. While the Ark of Grace remained in a chamber of the Sacred Mount, the Ark of Karma went out of Sinai where the with the people of Israel. Before leaving the Sinai, certain priests of Israel attached the rod of Moses to the Ark of Karma, causing the time rift from that meridian of time, part of the multi tear which creates the great Kali Rift. Now, pausing a moment, that doesn't mean the whole Kali Rift was created at that moment, but there are various rifts that were created along the whole sequencing of things, not just one giant one, that said, you know, this just kept tearing it and tearing it and tearing it, and this is one of them, one of the bigger ones. When Moses, or more correctly, Mosai, 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 entered the time continuum, the Rana, the archangel stone, which was the eye of the staff, remained with Aaron in order to invest him and thus his mystery school with the power of, of the Rana. Power of, no, I'm sorry, just a minute, with the power of, yes, the power of the Rana. The staff itself had been destroyed when it was attached to the Ark of Karma. Since that time, the archangel stone has passed through many portals and places. It now rests in its Ankh Ark beneath the sarcophagi of Torhana within the Tor Hill at Glastonbury. That is its location in your present. Um, this is... Kathleen was given the complete staff from its location in the dimension to which it ascended when it was destroyed in Moses' time. I believe she went through a visionary experience with it, and he's referring to that. Um, it is now in a holding state within the Marian temple, the higher temple of the Isis, Star of Isis. Uh, as Star Eagle, that's whom he called me then, and the Isis Templars bring it into the White Rose Altar, it will rise up from the Dragon Stone, center of the foundation of the altar, through the Obsidian Sphere, the Eye of the Eagle, and be transferred into the Frana Oblisk on the whole Holy Isle of Mana, 60, 68 AD. Yet it can be summoned to return in etheric multi-time within the Holy Foundation of the White Rose Altar. There is a corridor to be established between the front of Mana and the Star of Isis. Now, this was work we were doing on the inner plane, and it just sounds all so big and important. And yes, it is, but there are a lot of light workers doing a lot of energy work, and this was what we were doing. You know, I don't want to make this as we were creating universes. That's not what was happening here. But at, by the same token, it had its place. And 
it was a work, an intentional and viable work that we were doing at the time. The Farana Oblisk is located in the center of the temple city on the Holy Isle. It is surrounded uh, by the Temple of Isis. It is to be this, it is to this Mana temple that our work as the Star of Isis Foundation will align. The, and you know, I don't really think that it's ever complete, you know, we didn't have a Star of Isis Foundation anymore in the sense that I left that location, I moved to Crestone right after that, but it became another by another name. It's all the same work. All the work I've been doing from the beginning is the same work. I didn't quit one and start another and quit that and start another. It's all the same work. It's going through different translations and therefore different symbology as it moves. But what I'm reading this to you for is not about that. It's sort of worked into this material here, but it's about the actual temples and the actual energetic states that are there for you know, for all time. The Holy Isle of Mana has a corridor established within the Holy Isle of Ruta. Remember, that's the Ascended Isle of Atlantis, as well as the City of Lords on Mars. Wrens and other sacred Wren and other sacred key sites in various time frames. From the Farana, from the time point in which it becomes invested with the Rod of Moses, a bonding signal is sent, bringing together the many paths, uniting the light, and drawing all points into the third millennium consciousness, in which the Farana dwells. This uniting is an essential catalyst in healing the Kali Rift. Um... I'm skipping down a bit because it's talking about Star of Isis stuff. Uh, now he's giving me an understanding of the family tree. Let's see. As you enter the matrix of Farana, you are working with the Corbola station, which is essentially a manifesting plane. Now the Corbola is in this other time on the lip of the New Earth star. It's not quite in it. And it's this that he's referring to the 6068 and all of this. And Corbola is situated in that reality realm, correlative to the giant plateau that Masada was upon here in, in by the Dead Sea. So as you enter the matrix of Farana, you are working through the Corbola station, which is essentially a manifesting plane. The Corbola was created through the Ta, T-A, that's the Telesakara, the Telesakara, by the Sun Lords, the Syrian Lion Ones. Now the Telesakara is that capstone, pyramid capstone over the Eye of Ra, which is the actual tear, which is from which the, the Rana time wave is projected and all that. Oh, so, here you need to understand the family tree. One, the Syrians come to Earth in the human form, colonizing Hyperborea. Two, the Hyperborean land is destroyed by the Nephilim. Now, in within the Nephilim, we have the Anunnaki, but they're only one little fraction. I mean, you know, they've been, come, been made the rock stars of the whole... Um, idea of this that's going around now you know that's been perpetuated for a long time they existed and all of that happened but it's not understood fully according to Thoth and the Anunnaki were just one faction we've had other influences other interferences on this planet they're just one they're the one that's being publicized now because it's been found in the you know in the Assyrian texts and all of that okay remnant Hyperboreans migrate some to the Atlantean Isle of Ruta some to the Hibernian regions and later into Ireland. A few groups go elsewhere. Four, in the Hibernian regions, they mix with both human and nature beings. They have the ability to do this through their Syrian genetics. This is how the lion ones were created. This resultant race is the Twatha de Danan, who come to Ireland and mix further into the fairy world and the inner earth races. Part Syrian, part earth human, inner and outer, and part fairy, the Danan then are driven by invasion of a human race into the Rana, time continuum, where they are able to locate in another dimension and yet come back and forth between worlds. Five, the Tuatha Danan, or, or she, 
S-I-D-H-E, pronounced S-H-E-E, are related to both the Noachane of the Labyrinth, uh, that's in an inner earth thing, and the Hokamai tribe of the inner earth, who are the, the true guardians of, of the dweller crystal skulls that are in, that physically reside in the inner earth. And as we have been stated, as we have before stated, the Hokamai and Noachane are both relative tribes of the Dolphin Masters. Also, the Kumars, whose creations of the Nephilim mixed at one point with the She. So they, too, have some relation in this family tree. The Kumars are sort of negative ETs, okay? And they are very related to the Nephilim. I know, this is all terrifically confusing. I've just been guided to bring it forth and put it into your subconscious right now, those who are interested in listening to this, because in the subconscious it will give you a platform an inner platform for visions, workings that you're doing spontaneously, healings, all kinds of things can come out of this, even though you don't understand most of what I'm reading to you here. It's like all these names and places and things, you know. But it has it has a signal that I'm transferring to you as I read this to you. Or this is what I believe. We state all of this, as it is important to see the perigenetic interfaces of all these tribes or genetic groupings. On one dimension or another, they are all living beings related to the star seeding, the human and the nature of Earth. The manifestation of the Rod of Moses through the, uh, the altar, then it was the White Rose altar, now I have other altars. It's all the same para- platform, though, in various phases. phases. And so he's saying the manifestation of Rod of Moses through the altar and its insertion into the Farana was accomplished through what we did in the past, which still stands because it's all one. It's just looking at different levels and, and sequencing some of that. Whew, so that completes what I wanted to read to you on this particular video. And uh, I hope it has some energy frequency for you that you can feel the dynamic of it. So I appreciate your listening and thank you.